Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. In today's webinar, Susan Mudo and Lori McMahon will share the life and teachings of St. Therese of Lisieux. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Parish and Curriculum Marketing Specialist at Ave Maria Press. I would like to recognize our webinar partners, the National Association of Catholic Family Life Ministers, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the Catholic Campus Ministry Association. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions may be sent to the presenters using the um, GoToWebinar panel here that you see, and I will ask as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation today. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you via email tomorrow. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenters today. Susan Mudo, Executive Director of the Epiphany Association, is a renowned speaker, author, teacher, and Dean of the Epiphany Academy of Formative Spirituality. Lori Mitchell McMahon currently serves as a faculty member and program coordinator at Epiphany Academy of Formative Spirituality. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's our pleasure indeed, and we look forward to a wonderful presentation. As do we. Lori, I'm gonna go ahead and make you all presenters. Okay. There we go, how's that? All right, go ahead and take it away from here. Hey. So we will be pursuing with uh, great joy uh, the theme of the little way of spiritual childhood. And we will keep in mind as a thread that will weave it together this wonderful text from the autobiography of St. Therese, My Way is All Confidence and Love. And who of us would not like that to be our way as well? So we begin as we like to situate our spiritual master in a little bit of context on the stream of spiritual history. And we can see in this slide, just capturing the dates from approximately 1500 through 2000, just some of the masters along the way and to situate Therese right here in the red circle, you can see that uh, France in the late 1800s, Therese having died in 1897. 97. So truly it was a volatile time in her home country. It was the aftermath of Napoleon and the Napoleon Wars, the for forging of new governmental structures. Uh, it was also a vibrant era for the arts and photography. We are blessed because one of uh, Therese's own sister, Celine, in Carmel uh, became a photographer. So she's one of the most photographed uh, saints and obviously uh, an expansion of the arts as well as literature. And of course, the entire world was under colonial expansion. Uh, the opening up of the foreign missions, Therese actually prayed with and for many uh, clergy persons who were going um, off to places like uh, China in the Far East for the first time. And it was an era of pilgrimages. So really her context was quite lively and uh, I would say inspiring and energizing. And therefore uh, we wanted to see her uh, as very much part of her own country, Therese of Lisieux, Lisieux, France. Lazur being in uh, Normandy, in the Normandy part of France. And Therese's France and the France of that day was very Catholic indeed. So we see a dominance of the Catholic Church, very vibrant um, Catholic devotions and Catholic faithful. But also there was conflict with Protestant denominations such as Lutheranism and Calvinism and really trying to work all that out in the context of living together in the one nation of France. And here at the Academy of Formative Spirituality at Epiphany, we very much focus on 
the various schools of spirituality, sometimes the Carmelite school, the Augustinian school, the Ignatian school. But clearly here we want to lift up the French school of spirituality, of which Therese would be a representative. And that school emphasized uh, the devotional life of the Catholic faithful, very much devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and therefore evoking a personal experience, a person-to-person -person relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, a really intimate relationship with him. And we'll see that as we move into some of the uh, wonderful teachings of Therese. In other words, the quest for holiness that is the centerpiece of the French school is holiness coming through abandonment to God, the beautiful French word la bandonne, of which uh, Therese incorporates many thoughts about that in her poetry. So we will spend some more time with this beautiful notion of abandonment and what that meant, particularly for Therese. But first we wanted to introduce her, meeting Therese of Lisieux. You see her dates there, 1873 to 1897 just living to be 24 years of age. But she was born to a very devout family. And in fact, her parents have both been canonized in the Catholic Church. Um, she was the last of nine children. Her parents' names were Louis or Louis and Zilli. And she was born in January in Alencon, which is part of Normandy as well. Only five of the nine children, so Therese and four of her sisters, um, lived to adulthood and survived. What is striking, especially uh, as we enter into her autobiographical accounts, is her whole personhood, you might say her character. She was an intensely sensitive child and really acknowledged that temperament, and her parents did as well. But there was also something that seemed to be speaking deeply in Therese's heart, and it was uh, striking that already at the age of three, she got the idea that someday she would be a religious. And we can gain really interesting insights into Therese's own personality and her own sense of herself in her autobiography. And she was very much struck and wrote many years later about the death of her mother. She was greatly grieved by that. And she later reflects in her autobiography, the first part of my life stopped that day. She tended to think of her life in three kind of broad phases. And she identifies her mother's death and the intense grieving and, and the way that it really affected Therese with, um, as kind of a watershed um, event in her life. Yes, and in the family network, it's clear that uh, Therese's uh, father, Louis, uh, very much doted on her, uh, called her his little queen. Uh, she would have to grow up uh, someday from that uh, tag, but uh, no doubt uh, being lovely and beautiful and uh, missing her mother so much, she was indulged by her family and was there, therefore prone, as we already indicated to physical and emotional hypersensitivity. But thanks be to God, uh, her older sister Pauline uh, stepped in, stepped up uh, and helped Therese. She was named by Therese a kind of second mother when Therese was 19 years old. But it was another uh, difficult parting when Pauline entered the Carmelite Monastery. Uh, at that moment, Therese felt crushed that she had lost her second mother, believing that she would never see her sister again. But of course, God had other plans. It's interesting, too, how Therese reflects on that, um, the nature of her hypersensitivity. She, she relays to us that even if someone would look at her in a cross way, she would just dissolve into tears. So she understood, especially in retrospect, that this was a huge um, temperamental issue that she really had to navigate and and as we'll see she was um, really aided by grace in the healing of that hypersensitivity. And she does write of what really for her was a, a little miracle on the Feast of Pentecost uh, when she was terribly devastated by these losses and the um, nervous uh, condition that she had to endure uh, she had uh, a statue of our Blessed Mother placed at the foot of her bed. And her experience was such that uh, the Virgin smiled on her. She writes of this in her autobiography. And she really began to see that it was Our Lady that planted in Therese a great devotion, which, of course, would be uh, 
um, devoted in a special way to uh, Mary as the mother of Mount Carmel in later years. Mm -hmm. So that is an image of the statue that was actually in the home of Therese and her sisters and parents. Yes, Our Lady of Victory. And Therese received her first communion and confirmation then the following year. One of the most important uh, set of paragraphs in uh, the story of a soul is the rendition of what Therese felt was her Christmas Eve conversion. This happened at the age of 13, and she notes it specifically, Christmas Eve 1886, a very profound conversion that changed her life. It had a lot to do with the fact that she would no longer see herself as the little queen of her father, no, nor want to be. She felt that that was holding her back from Jesus. And so she writes in the story of the soul, I received the grace of leaving my childhood, in a word, the grace of my complete conversion. I felt charity enter into my soul, the need to forget myself, it was hugely important. God worked to make me grow up in an instant. So Therese has this amazing insight into her own formation story, you could say, that she remembers this formative, what we would call formative event, a deep and profound event of her life where she re can, can actually track and trace within her own heart that conversion from a real self-centeredness and being completely indulged by her family, her sisters and her father, to a sense of we start to trace this little bit of abandonment, an abandonment to the Lord's way, and that kind of pushing her own ego and her own sense of self-importance out of the center of her life and really accommodating and by, by the virtue of grace, making room for a more God-oriented life. And this is all when she was just 13 years old. Right. And while she will give us the doctrine of the little way of spiritual childhood, it connects to the fact that here she would for, forsake her childish ways. The childish ways of Therese are not the same as the way of spiritual childhood. And it was uh, necessary for her to understand that uh, the person that would arm her to go forward with courage, especially in the suffering that she would endure, was God himself. And so linked to this conversion moment was her call to love God more intimately and certainly to move away from the excessive self-preoccupation that is childish. So by the time Therese is 13, we have these two amazing uh, parts of her conversion story. One of this healing through the, the smile of the Virgin that she's really healed of that intense hypersensitivity and nervous nervousness to such a degree that it took over her whole body. And then we have this other amazing story that on Christmas Eve, and you can read again in, in her own autobiography. So we see kind of squeezed into a very short timeline chronologically some very profound graces that are, are leading Therese to more and more spiritual maturity. So as we probe uh, more deeply into her life, uh, by the age of 14, she felt deeply uh, a call to Carmel. Certainly Pauline was already in the Carmelite community in Lisieux. This, of course, conflicted with the wish of her father, who wanted her to be at home, but he eventually gave his uh, permission. However, the problem was that such a young age, uh, in terms of the ecclesiastical rules, she was much too young to enter Carmel. But uh, for Therese, uh, it was important to hear this call. And so she began to petition, for example, the bishop of that diocese, the request to, uh, for an exception to enter Carmel at the age of 15. And uh, her father, uh, Louis, uh, wanted to kind of test the waters there and took her on a pilgrimage to Rome uh, with Celine, but uh, it was in Rome that Therese uh, went a little higher in her request and begged the Holy Father himself for permission uh, to enter Carmel. Oh, Holy Father, if you say yes, everybody will agree. Uh, but of course, uh, he, she writes, he gazed at me speaking these words and stressing each syllable and says, the words that she knew she had to hear in her heart, go, go, you will enter Carmel if God wills it. Uh, and of course, uh, 
imagine having to be dragged away by the Swiss guard from the Pope's feet. But in fact, uh, it was God's way because there we are after Christmas in 1887, the Bishop of Bayeux, their diocese, authorized her to enter Carmel. And particularly her actual entrance uh, would be postponed till the following year, but nonetheless, she was in the door. And this then gives us uh, St. Therese of Lisieux. So we can see just from these, um, the, the short narrative of these events, some more of Therese's personality, you know, certainly vivacious, uh, certainly courageous, um, thinking out of the box, you could say, in, in the sense of petitioning the Pope, having the gumption to petition the Pope himself and having to be dragged away by the Swiss guard. There is such a sense of her life being moved from within. I mean, she did not have a lot of time chronologically. And so uh, there we are already in 1888, uh, about uh, 10 years before her death, that she said goodbye to home, goodbye to family, and was thrilled that she was going to live forever in what was a symbol of Carmel, that was the desert that Jesus would be with her and she would be um, his enclosed companion. And it was at the age of 15 when she was entering officially into Carmel that she took as her name, Therese of the Infant Jesus. You hear in there the little way of spiritual childhood and the holy face, a face on, upon which she would gaze uh, many, many times in her life. Mm -hmm. So during this time when she was in Carmel, um, her father's health worsened, and this was another tremendous cross for Therese. He became senile and was afflicted with dementia, eventually became paralyzed by a series of strokes, but he did manage to attend um, Therese's clothing in the Carmelite habit, that uh, beautiful ceremony in 1889, but then slipped further into dementia and died two years later, and again, she writes very tenderly of that loss um, in her autobiography. Here again, of course, we're so blessed that it was the age of photography because we have these wonderful photos. Uh, having witnessed the humiliating demise of her father, Therese interpreted that in a very profound way. She interpreted every little event of life at a deeply profound level and always tried to link suffering her own and those she loved with those of Jesus, you know, scourged and crowned with thorns. And uh, it was uh, not going to be a forever event. Only nine more years were left of her life in Carmel. But there in the presence of the sisters, uh, something occurred that we never want to forget. And that is she was drawn not to special uh, privileges, but she entered directly into the menial, menial duties of the Carmel, cleaning and laundry and gardening and caring for the elder sisters. And that she felt was how she could live the little way of spiritual childhood and really bring a message of its deepest meaning to the uh, nuns that accompanied her and also eventually to the novices. She was asked to give them some help as well. Mm -hmm. So it was a full Carmel at that time. Uh, normally uh, there's the uh, fullness of 21, but apparently there were 24 nuns, and uh, this is uh, something that uh, Therese must have loved, just being with other women, young and old, who were dedicated uh, to their spouse, Jesus Christ. So we can see um, in the photograph here on the right, if you can see my cursor, this is Therese, uh, second or third from the left, with her sisters on a laundry day. At Carmel. She does tell some very engaging stories about some incidents in the laundry. One, one of the times one of the sisters was just in a very mean way, just splashing filthy water on Therese. And we have all kinds of stories coming out of the laundry. So, so she was uh, allowed, permitted uh, to make her final profession on September, in September of 1890 at the age of 17. She was a prolific and creative writer, not only of prayers and poetry, but she also composed a short plays uh, that the sisters would perform. She had, has one that's uh, really quite wonderful on uh, St. Joan of Arc, another uh, French saint. And she tried to utilize the gifts that God had given her. And again, one of them for great interpretation, like 
when the dirty water was splashed on her in the laundry room, she interpreted it as, as a second baptism. We can laugh at that, but it was Tres trying to see the meaning in everything that happened to her. And uh, she was directed uh, by the then prioress of Carmel to start to write down the events in her own life. You could say that this little masterpiece uh, was written under obedience, uh, but Tres began writing it two years before her death in 1895. And one of the things about Therese, I think, that sometimes is, is easily missed is the tremendous suffering that she endured. She was plagued by both body and, we would say, soul sickness, suffering greatly. Um, she had tuberculosis, was, was coughing up blood, was very, very ill. But she was also assailed by severe temptations of doubt and a dark night. We I think most recently heard something similar to this when folks were discovering the diaries of Teresa of Calcutta and were kind of confounded by this darkness and this darkness of faith that, that she endured. And there's a similar um, struggle and challenge in Teresa's life. She experienced intense periods of aridity in prayer, certainly lack of spiritual consolations that she had been graced with earlier in her young life. So this is an excerpt from a beautiful um, poetry from one of the poems of St. Therese. She says, Jesus, holy and sacred vine, O my divine King, you know I am a cluster of golden grapes which must disappear for you. Under the wine press of suffering, I shall prove my love for you. I want no other joy than to sacrifice myself each day. So it's that profound sense in Therese's heart that she would relate and connect her own suffering and unite that with the heart of Jesus. And she believed in the redemptive power of suffering and the redemptive graces that could help transform the world. So in that sense, we have Therese later being designated a patroness of, of missions and a huge evangelizer, even though her short life was, was spent within the confines of the Carmel. And certainly the more we meditate on the life of uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, doctor of the church, the more we realize that the images of her that are reduced to sentimentality as if the little flower is some weak little uh, bud on a vine that's, uh, you know, half dead. That's completely false because this was a really incredibly brave and courageous woman. And she knew that... Uh, the end was beginning to be near uh, in Easter of 1896 when she began coughing up blood. There was really no real um, medical solution to tuberculosis at that time. And uh, she was aware that uh, the deepening trials, what St. John of the Cross, whom she writes was her great teacher in Carmel, she said uh, already at the age of 18, the only books that she could read were the collected works of St. John of the Cross. And so she had a definite understanding of his teaching on the dark night of the senses, because certainly with this disease, she reached the point where she could literally taste nothing and the dark night of the spirit. But uh, with that, uh, the faith grows. And St. John of the Cross tells us in his collected works, the only proximate means to union with God is naked faith at the midnight moment. So she wrote in one of her letters, she has a many, many uh, voluminous writings that are not only prayers and poetry, but also letters. She says to uh, the superior, Mother Marie, up until this time, I had a faith so living and lucid that the thought of heaven was the sum of all my happiness. But now my soul is overrun with an impenetrable darkness, a magnificent description of the dark night of the soul. You must imagine that I have been born in a country entirely overspread with a thick mist. And now all of a sudden the mists, mists around me have become denser than ever. They seek deep into my soul and wrap it round so that I cannot recover the dear image of my native country anymore. Everything has disappeared. Dear mother, what's left now to hinder my soul from taking its flight? The only thing I want badly now is to go on loving till I die of love. Now, it's interesting that we mentioned Teresa of Calcutta. Her name was 
Teresa, as in Teresa of Avila, but she originally wanted her name to be Therese because of this, because she felt that Therese, young as she was, understood the dark nights of sense and of spirit and would go on loving till she died of love. So despite her excruciating suffering, Therese continued to write. And as we'll see in a moment, when we take a brief overview of her writings, there are three versions of the manuscript for the story of a soul. So 18 months later in a, sorry, is my screen still good? Now we see some of your um, email, your inbox. So I think maybe if you click on the slide of the webinar or of yeah. the PowerPoint, maybe it'll go full screen. Yeah, sorry, I don't know how that That's happened. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me do this. There we go. Okay. Um, yep. Thanks. And so mm -hmm. she had. Um, 18 months later, she died in agony at the age of 24. And she was canonized only 28 years after her death, which is remarkable. She had uh, been named patroness of France, a patroness of the missions, and also was later named a doctor of the church and is truly one of the saints who we have the greatest devotion for even to this day. Just a brief uh, summary of her works. Uh, on her deathbed, she said to the sisters, I am not dying, I am entering life. And the life that was her life produced a remarkable body of work. Not only the story of a soul, which uh, quickly became a publishing phenomena and has never gone out of print, but also these two major volumes of letters uh, letters to priests, to lay people, to other religious, uh, a wonderful uh, collection of poetry, uh, well done. I mean, people uh, really admire her uh, gifts as a poetess and then a collection of her prayers. So we have all of these uh, books available to us through the Institute of Carmelite Studies. They keep these books in print and uh, certainly there's uh, no doubt that one can get us story of a soul in on many different uh, from many different outlets mm -hmm. so having spent a little bit of time um, just situating therese in history and then talking about her amazing life story we wanted to raise up this notion of her little way of spiritual childhood and we chose for today just three facets of that little way and she herself defined her doctrine of the little way as the way of spiritual childhood, the way of trust and absolute surrender. And we saw on the initial slide, the way of confidence and love. So these are the phrases that Therese herself used to describe this little way. And she was probably the last person that would have expected to ever write anything that anyone else would ever read. It's kind of a paradox of the highest order of the Holy Spirit raising up this young, very seriously ill, um, woman who was devout and no one really in, in Carmel had a sense of this interior life that was so rich and profound and by some some grace of the Holy Spirit her sister asking her to write so it was really after her death and the release of the story of a soul that the world came to know this amazing person and soul and saint I feel that if you found a soul weaker and littler than mine you would be pleased to grant it still greater favors, provided, and this is the key now, provided it abandoned itself with total confidence to your infinite mercy. And that is truly the key to the little way of spiritual childhood, l'abandonne. So the first facet of Therese's little way that we wanted to raise up today was the little way of simplicity. And Therese, again, um, teaching us how, how do we learn to love our littleness? She, she loved her littleness and had a deep sense of that, a very real sense. These are her words. I look upon myself as a weak little bird with only a light down as covering. In spite of my extreme littleness, I still dare to gaze upon the divine sun. Let us remain very remote from all that glitters. Let us love our littleness. 
and then we shall be poor in spirit and Jesus will come for us far off as we are. He will transform us in love's furnace. Uh, when um, her works were being examined with the possibility of being named a doctor of the church, they were declared to be without error, totally rooted in the teachings of Holy Scripture and the traditions of the spiritual writers that had preceded her, like another doctor of the church, uh, John of the Cross. But here again, um, very important questions are raised by Therese. Do we love our littleness? We live in an era where everything is big, 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 more and more spectacular. But how can we grow in poor poverty of spirit, see the kingdom of heaven, but also connected by uh, Therese over and over again was this possibility of transformation that we are being transformed, as St. Paul says, and she loved his epistles. She really read them line by line. We are being transformed from glory unto glory. And this is where we see the sense of this childlike, these childlike attributes and, and facets of Therese's own spirit, this littleness and simplicity, very far from childish and childishness. So think of it, the little way of simplicity, what does that mean? Uncomplicated, lacking in gall, guile, childlike, putting to rest the excessively functional pressures that chronically complicate our lives. This is why we uh, turn to Therese for very solid advice in our own era, uh, that uh, life is overly complicated. Uh, there's uh, the culture of the lie, as one writer has said, and uh, the commitment to simplicity to try to uncomplicate our lives and not be caught, be caught so much in functional pressures that we don't even have time for God. Because Therese's goal in Carmel was to try to remain in God's presence in the laundry, in the choir, in the garden with simple attentiveness. Very much connected with the French school, you hear these same th themes echoed in Jean-Pierre de Cassade's Abandonment to Divine Providence, in Brother Lawrence's The Practice of the Presence of God. Mm -hmm. And just one more slide to further explore this little way of simplicity. It also means and carries with it this deep sense of celebrating the sacred in the here and now. now. So we, we know that Therese was completely immersed in the ordinary, in the routines uh, that were demanded of her, um, gardening and, and laundry and cleaning and pushing wheelchairs for her elder sisters. So Therese really is a wonderful guide in, in showing us how to wait upon reality as it is, not filtering it through this viewfinder of our own complicated expectations, but really being present to the moment and the Holy Spirit in the moment um, with all the tasks that we're immersed in in our ordinary lives. She writes in the story, the closer one approaches God, the simpler one becomes. We've seen, of course, that she was probably very attuned to Jesus uh, welcoming the children on his lap and reminding all of us in scripture, unless you become like one of these, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And Therese wanted to understand what does it mean to be one of these? So we've already seen that it means to exercise the virtue of simplicity, but it also has a lot to do, this little way of spiritual childhood, with uh, living life uh, in the context of unceasing prayer, that there's no moment if we're really attentive when we cannot be living in, in awe and wonder uh, in relation to the mystery that surrounds us. So for Therese, all of life, all of her relationships, her daily struggles, her joys become openings to prayer. She describes prayer as a surge of the heart a very simple phrase, a surge of the heart, a simple look toward heaven, a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. So Therese really centers for us this notion of prayer in the heart, not in long words and lots of verbiage and an intellectual exercise, but she situates it like a laser 
right at the center of our heart. And it's important that Therese really had an opportunity for educating herself in the classical works of the spiritual masters, but she developed an approach to theology that was incredibly formative. It had to do with loving everyday life and letting the experiences that happen to us in the most common way point us to prayer, point us to the mystery. And so uh, loving God as she did, her heart would surge toward him. And there would be in her a sense that uh, unceasing prayer was really abiding uh, and co-abiding actually with uh, God and Therese. They, they, they entered into a beautiful partnership. So this was um, the ground of intimacy that Therese experienced with Jesus himself. She talks about um, her love of prayer and scripture and says, I find just when I need them certain lights that I had not seen until then, and not most frequently during my hours of prayer that these are most abundant, but rather in the midst of my daily occupation. So here again, she's referring to that immersion in the in the ordinary and yet being present to the sacred she says never have i heard him speak but i feel that he is within me at each moment guiding and inspiring me with what i must say and do so a full intersection of the ordinary rhythms of life with prayer and an intimacy with the lord and of course it would have been impossible in terms of her immersion in the Carmelite tradition, not to see this surge of the heart toward God in a Trinitarian terms. I mean, the, the spirit of the living God is guiding her and inspiring her and helping her to be more uh, aware of what Jesus was asking of her. Therefore, for her, prayer, again, uh, enabled her to love others as Jesus loved them. This was the challenge. All is confidence and love. So if you're really living a life of unceasing prayer, it's going to make you much more loving toward those around you. Love God, love neighbor, love self. And Therese really felt responsible to gain a spiritual understanding of people, events, and things. And certainly it was not easy for her in Carmel. She was quite young and uh, she was surrounded by a lot of elderly nuns, some of whom were pleasant, but some who may not have been terribly pleasant, but she wanted to let every occasion of encounter with her neighbor become an opening to uh, living life uh, as Jesus would live it. And so therefore she had to uh, find a way of making sense of things that might otherwise have been irritating or annoying. And this is a wonderful uh, de description in the story of the soul of just that uh, way of making an encounter, an opening to love and prayer. And so Teresa remarks. She says, um, this is in reference to one of the sisters that she very candidly writes about um, having some struggles with. And she says, I was not content simply with praying very much for this sister who gave me so many struggles, but I took care to render her all the services possible. So this is a tremendous and heroic virtue that Therese is exercising. When I was tempted to answer her back in a disagreeable manner, I was content with giving her my most friendly smile and with changing the subject of the conversation. So we get the sense that in the rhythms of an ordinary day, these circumstances would arise. Um, Therese writes about, for instance, one of the sisters in chapel who apparently clicked her dentures all the time. And I mean, she tells some really, really funny stories about real life and real characters. Um, living in Carmel. So uh, we love sharing this photo also of Therese, who's on the right here, uh, with some of her sisters, trying to imagine which one may have had the dentures or right. not sure. And, and this actually is the beginning of what came to be known in uh, Theresian's, Theresian studies as the origin of the Ministry of the Smile. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one of the uh, characteristics of Therese, rather than arguing and getting into controversial encounters, she preferred to smile. <laughs> so the third facet of Therese's little way that we wanted to raise up today was her little way of abandonment, which is really a very 
profound way. She shows us the wisdom of abandoning ourselves to the mystery of God's transforming love. And again, we hear echoes of the littleness and the simplicity in these words of Therese. Yet I am but a poor little thing who would return to nothingness if your divine glance did not give me life from one moment to the next. So tremendous exercise of trust and confidence in God in that statement that she herself completely appreciates her own littleness and her own insufficiency. Really one of the uh, focal points of what we could say it was her feminine genius, a phrase used by St. John Paul II was just this, that she taught herself, first of all, but also especially the young novices to rely wholly on the care and providence of God, not to rely on ourselves. And so she says, I don't count on my merits since I have none, but I trust in him who is virtue and holiness. So this orientation of her whole being toward her, her core and her center in Christ is really uh, beautiful and part of the masterful way in which she teaches foundational spirituality. So exploring a little bit more this way of abandonment, living in a childlike surrender. So again, childlike, very far from childish ways. Jesus deigned to show me the road that leads to this divine furnace. And the road is the surrender of the little child who sleeps without fear in its father's arms. A beautiful quote from Story of a Soul. And therefore, again, exercising unshakable belief in the depth of God's love for souls, writing, for among his own disciples, he finds few hearts who surrender to him without reservation, who understand the real tenderness of his infinite love. Let us pray that we are among those few hearts today. It's another metaphor from Therese that stays with us this way of a compass, abandonment as a compass. And in exercising this full surrender of her will in faith, hope, and love, she says, to ascend the mountain of love, Jesus does not ask for great actions, but only abandon and gratitude. So again, she's raising up these virtues for us, simplicity, trust, confidence, abandonment, gratitude, it is love alone that attracts me. Abandonment alone guides me. I have no other compass. So again, we have this incredible sim simplicity that is not necessarily easy, but Therese is always leading us and kind of shaving away superfluous and complicated things and, and really um, exhorting us to a, a way of beautiful simplicity. And again, courage. I mean, God asked a lot of her, but she still says, oh, how sweet is the way of love. How I want to apply myself to doing the will of God always with the greatest self-surrender. And certainly her last conversations, uh, many of the poem, poems that she wrote, uh, she lived what she taught. And therefore there's an authenticity to Therese and an exemplary a witness to what it is to be a true disciple uh, in her world and the inspiration for our world today. Mm -hmm. So just in summary, we have a few points that we wanted to raise. Our happiness, teaches Therese, is found in these virtues of accepting our littleness and having simple confidence in God's benevolence, God's care, God's unconditional love, his mercy, his forgiveness. And then our prayer needs to be grounded in intimacy, Trinitarian intimacy with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that prayer, that surge of the heart will then intersect all the trials and joys of our daily life. And then the exercise of our hearts, she raises up these virtues of abandonment and gratitude, casting the whole of our life into the tender mercy of God's providence. And we wanted to uh, bring these thoughts to conclusion by suggesting that Therese's teaching calls the church back to a fresh and creative expression of gospel holiness that is accessible to everyone achieved uh, in her little way. 
And among her prayers, she writes, tomorrow, with the help of your grace, I will begin a new life in which each moment will be an act of love and renunciation. And also from the prayers of Therese, uh, we will offer this closing prayer and then open uh, out a few questions. But this uh, prayer comes from the same text called the prayers of Therese. And let us pray that uh, with reverence. O oh God, I come to you with joy each evening to thank you for the graces you have given me. I ask pardon for the faults I committed today, which has just slipped away like a dream. Often in the evening I am sad because I feel I could have corresponded better with your graces. And yet, oh my God, very far from becoming discouraged at the sight of my miseries, I come to you with confidence, recalling that those who are well do not need a doctor, but the sick do. I beg you then to cure me and to pardon me. I will keep in mind, Lord, that the soul to whom you have forgiven more should also love you more than others. I offer you every beat of my heart as so many acts of love and reparation, and I unite them to your infinite merits. Tomorrow, with the help of your grace, I will begin a new life in which each moment will be an act of love and renunciation. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, I invite all of you on with us today to um, type in questions for Susan and Lori. I am touched so much by your presentation and by the great, the great faith, the great trust of St. Therese. Um, how would you say or suggest somebody who works in ministry could really bring this wisdom that we learned from her life and her experiences to the people that they minister to? I know it's a big question. <laughs> I think, Therese, I mean, being in Carmel was really enveloped in a lot of silence. So I think especially, and yet she was still immersed in the day-to-day. -day. But, but for laity and for those in ministry to have some sense of um, kind of a ground of silence where everything else flows from, and, and that she carried that with her interiorly, even if the the complexities of her life were demanding attention and 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 demanding her engagement. She 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 really was a contemplative in action. So so maybe Aaron, what you're pressing towards is that integration of contemplation and action. And, and Therese is such a beautiful yes. example of that for us. I would also say that there's uh, something um, of great importance in our world, uh, which uh, is often surrounded by vice, to focus on the life of virtue, to really uh, lift up, for example, in the face of uh, falsehood and complexity, the simplicity that is called for, uh, to raise up uh, in a do-it-yourself world uh, projects of self-salvation, the importance of the virtue of abandonment. I think um, our ministry, especially as we try to understand the deepest meaning of discipleship, I, I feel very strongly that we have to focus more. I wrote a book called Virtues, Your Christian Legacy for that reason. I think we're, we forfeit that legacy if we don't focus on uh, the need for a, a heart full of virtue in order to be a disciple. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting that Therese talks really about an exercise of virtue in that short example when she says the ministry of the smile. She was aware of those feelings of, you know, wanting to be combative and maybe come back with a snarky remark at the sister that was frankly driving her crazy. But she, she very much is practicing, and I think that's what Susan's talking about in the, a legacy of virtue, she's she's actively practicing virtue. So she has an awareness of her own faults, first of all, and is certainly steeped in reality of seeing the situation as it is. And yet she's choosing 
to exercise. So it's like we exercise our bodies. We need to exercise virtue. And that's sometimes we can think of virtue as just, oh, I wish I'd just be more patient, but we don't, we miss the part about having to exercise it and the, right. all the opportunities we're given to exercise it. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Got some questions coming in here. Um, Kathy asks, did St. Therese see suffering as a means to salvation? I would say unquestionably, especially in the French school of spirituality, uh, there was a sense of uh, entering into the atoning suffering of Jesus, that uh, every little suffering, and this doesn't have to be dramatic suffering, it's like uh, tuberculosis, but if we accept the little crosses of everyday life, I mean, uh, you know, going to a gas station when our, our tank is almost empty and we see a big sign, no gas today. I mean, we get, we get very upset and aggravated. It's kind of a cross, but Therese says, interpret that. Interpret it as uh, you don't always get your own way. Jesus didn't get his own way when he was dragged uh, through the streets uh, carrying the cross. And if you enter into those little crosses, you really are literally radiating the meaning of suffering as atoning for something going on in the mystical body of Jesus that we may not realize, but no suffering is ever wasted. This was absolutely something that Therese believed strongly. Mm -hmm. Chris asks, please give an opinion on the way of Therese, which can be used by busy people. An opinion. The way of Therese, which could be used by busy people. Uh, number one, uh, ask yourself, is my busyness just the business of being a functionary, uh, a pencil pusher, or somebody that is seeking fame and success, or is my busyness ultimately rooted in uh, the business of trying to do God's will in every little way in my life. This is from the business of making beds in the morning to maybe writing a book. That's the, that's the question. I mean, we, we might um, fall into busyness for the sake of busyness rather than uh, the winning uh, challenge that Therese gives us. How can you be busy with every little thing that you have to do and still be united with Christ? This is that great art of being an active contemplative and a contemplative in action. I think Therese certainly was in a cloistered Carmelite community, but uh, all the normal work of life went on. You have to eat, you have to make tables, you have to do laundry. And so there was busyness, but the busyness did not become something separate from the life of prayer. It was totally integrated. And I think returning again to that sense of a practice of a prayer of presence, that whatever the task is before us, there's still a practice and a deeper level of being present to the sacred. So kind of the sacred reality of the ordinary is, is something that Therese really shows us. Mm -hmm. well, I'm getting lots of thank yous. Thank you for your insight on St. Therese. Um, people are asking about the prayer that you ended with, um, and I'm happy to say that Susan and Lori are sharing their PowerPoint, their presentation with all of you tomorrow. Um, so I'll put a little note in the email and you can request to get a copy of that from me. Um, Rosemary says, I just want to say that the exercise of smiling all the time really works. I have several friends that have told me that I conquered them by smiling. And, and Therese would be delighted. She, she'd be delighted. Yes. It even works uh, in, in an era when people are wearing masks because, as someone said to me the other day on a checkout counter, because we were uh, making eye contact, she said, thank you for smiling at me with your eyes. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, we have to understand that the, any, any little contact, human to human, uh, with a smile, be it of the eyes or of the lips, it actually can be life-changing. And I think Therese uh, practiced and recommended uh, as a ministry among um, all kinds of characters that lived in Carmel, her smile. Yes. 
and we never know what people are suffering with, you know, just as she suffered so much, and a little smile really can make such a, a big difference in someone's life. Robin says, oh, they're coming in fast here. Okay, Robin says, just a comment to Susan. I give a silent retreat overlaying Therese's spirituality over the spiritual exercises of Ignatius, and your book has been helpful in my research. Wonderful. Yes. Um, I, I know, Erin, that uh, there's a couple of books that uh, we've tried to devote to uh, Therese's teaching. Uh, that book, certainly, 12 Little Ways to Transform Your Life, uh, A Feast mm -hmm. for Hungry Souls, and, and the yeah. book on gratitude. They all feature Therese in some way. Yeah, and we're gonna, I'm going to show those to you in just a second. Just one more comment. Maureen says, this was brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm smiling, she said. <laughs> We're trying to do the same. <laughs> Love that. You know, after a hard year, um, I think just that simple little sentiment or lesson from Therese really can go very far. Um, for our own spiritual growth, or our own lives, as well as the people that we interact with and reach out to. So ladies, thank you once again. Always delightful to have you with us. Um, you, you share your joy and your real um, affection for the saints. And we, we see that that's contagious. Um, and I hope that we can all incorporate the saints as friends into our own lives, right? Who we can walk with um, on this journey. Right. Yes. So here are the books that Susan just mentioned that she has written, 12 Little Ways to Transform Your Heart, A Feast for Hungry Souls, and Gratefulness. Um, and so we always want to give you a little a little discount to, to make this um, possible for you if you're interested in purchasing any of these books using code webinar0511 for today's date, um, and that will expire on the 21st, of course, when shopping at AveMariaPress.com. Remember, too, that all of our past recordings are um, on our website, so if you've missed any, you can go check them out. Um, Susan and Lori have done a few others on saints too that you can um, access I definitely and, if anybody would want to know a little bit more about the epiphany academy just go on our website um, epiphanyassociation.org i will also include that in the email that goes out to all of you tomorrow okay. thank you Next Tuesday, we are not going to have a webinar, but the following Tuesday on May 25th, this will be the last one for our spring season, um, Father Bob, Reverend Robert Cannon, um, is going to discuss uh, the church's teaching on marriage, just a little brief um, introduction of the theology of marriage, but more importantly, how can we accompany and walk with the uh, divorced Catholics and those seeking annulments? Um, I will send out an email tomorrow for all of you. And um, he's also requesting if you wanted to submit a question or a concern that you have that you'd like him to specifically address in the webinar, he would be happy to do that also. So I certainly hope that you can join us Tuesday, May 25th. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Susan and Lori, for sharing Thank your time you. with us. And we'll you. See you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.